Hey, today's Pentecost Sunday. What is Pentecost Sunday? 50th, that's right. Penti simply means 50. Well, what does 50 represent? Well, 50 days after Passover, the Jewish people were commanded to celebrate another feast, and that was the Feast of Pentecost. What was that feast? Well, it really had a couple of reasons. One reason was to celebrate the spring harvest, to show their gratitude for the harvest that they had. But it was also to remember it coincided with the giving of the Old Testament law. So the Old Testament law was given. The Ten Commandments were given. uh, And then what God chose to do is on that Feast of Pentecost, he chose to pour out his spirit and birth the New Testament church in a very fresh and new way by giving the Spirit. So the Old Testament is kind of a look at the giving of the law as far as we look at Pentecost. New Testament, the giving of the Spirit. We're no longer under the law, we're under the Spirit. Doesn't mean that we don't have guidelines that can direct us. The Ten Commandments are still really good to follow. Can I get an amen? Uh, But we recognize that the Old Testament law was kind of the giving of death because 3,000 people were killed at the giving of the law. But on the birth of the New Testament church, there were 3,000 people that were saved at the giving of the Spirit. Pretty incredible. So we see a big contrast. We're people, New Testament people, people of the Spirit. Uh, And God's gift, his greatest gift to the church is the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about this gift of the Holy Spirit today. And I want to do this in a way, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to have to slow it down and just teach a few things today because I want you to understand what this wonderful gift is that we have. I know it's probably the most controversial thing in the church today, but it's the one thing that separates us from most of the other churches in this area, this understanding of the Holy Spirit, God's gift to us. We all love gifts, right? You love getting gifts? I love getting gifts. I I love giving gifts. I love giving gifts. Uh, Starla and I, we found a a method that works good for us when it comes to gift giving. We go to the mall, whether it's birthdays or Father's Day or Mother's Day, sometimes even Christmas. We'll go to the mall and we split up and she shops for herself and I shop for myself and we come back together and surprise each other with what we got. And uh, you know what? We both get exactly what we want. It works for us. I don't know if that'll work for you. You may need the surprise element, but uh, that works for us. God's given us a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to take a few minutes and I want to just take you through some scriptures that show us the foundation of this gift. And then I'm going to do just a little bit of teaching that hopefully when we're done here, you'll have a better understanding of this gift. I think some people just kind of run away from it, cover their ears and pretend uh, they, they don't want to know. Don't miss out on this great gift. All right, John 14, verse number 16, Jesus said, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. What was he talking about? Well, Jesus was talking about since he was going to ascend back to heaven, he wanted to Make sure that we still had a counselor, a comforter here with us, somebody who walks right beside us, giving us aid and help. That's the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter one, verse number four, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. So Jesus gave the command to his disciples, wait right here in Jerusalem until you get the gift that my father's promised. And then if we jump ahead, In the teachings of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Anytime you see the Lord's will or the will of the Lord in the Bible, you should pay attention. Right? You want to know what God's will is, right? We want to do God's will. So you need to know what it is. And he says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And then he explains, don't get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. In fact, the Message Bible says it like this. Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God. I'm going to talk to you about drinking the Spirit of God today. But if you go back to the NIV version, it says, don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. So I'm going to try to help you understand just a little bit today what the, the, the Lord's will is, which is to be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? How can we experience that? 
There are five different occasions in the Word of God that we are to be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is, this is where it'll bring some clarification because some people think, well, hey, I got, I got the Spirit. I was filled with the Spirit when I got saved. Yes, you did. And some people say, well, no, 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 that's not the Spirit. You got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You got to speak in tongues. That's when you get the Spirit. Well, you're right too. But then there's other occasions. I'm going to show you these occasions because the, the gift is for everybody. Can I get an amen? So here's the first time you're filled with the Spirit when you're saved. Number one, when you're saved. Yes, when you get saved, you can't get saved without the Spirit because this is the first encounter when Jesus approached his disciples after he had been raised from the dead, right before he's ascended back to the right hand of the Father. He comes to his disciples and he said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, the day of Pentecost has not happened yet. Acts 2, 4 has not happened yet. This is prior to that. So Jesus is breathing the Holy Spirit on his disciples. What is that? That's at their salvation. That's when they are regenerated. That's when they become born again. They receive the Holy Spirit. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. So you are filled with the Holy Spirit, yes, when you are saved. But there is a second time that you are to be filled with the Spirit. And that is when you are baptized in the Spirit. And we, I'll, I'll explain this word baptized just a little bit. But I want you to notice the same people that were, go back to number one. Same people that were here, go to number two, are here. What do I mean by that? Those that received the Holy Spirit, it was breathed on them that we read in John 20. Now here they are in Acts 1, receiving the Holy Spirit again, being filled again. Acts 1, 4, and 5, on one occasion while he was eating with him, gave him this command, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father's promised, which you've heard me speak about. Go to the next. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you will receive, verse 8, power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, some people get this word baptized kind of confused. It's not really any, there shouldn't be any confusion. Baptism in water, the word baptism literally means immersed. What does that mean? You get dumped. I mean, you are completely wet. You go completely under the water, immersed in water. That's why when we baptize, whether it's here in the front or uh, out under the carport, we immerse you in water because that's what baptism means. But baptism in water is a physical act. That's different than being baptized in the Spirit. But if baptism in water means being immersed in water, how are we immersed in the Spirit? How does that happen? Well, here's my simple solution for that, is the Bible teaches us in the book of James that your tongue is the rudder of your life. He compares the tongue to a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder on a, a ship. Small thing, but the small rudder directs the course of the ship. Small bit in a horse's mouth, but it directs the, the, the focus and the direction of a massive stallion. The same way our tongue controls our whole life. Out of the tongue is life and death, right? So when the tongue is surrendered to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has control of everything. You're immersed in the Spirit when the Holy Spirit has control of the tongue. Now, some people have, have taught that, that tongues were simply used to communicate the gospel on the day of Pentecost so that people could all hear the Word of God. Now, we know Acts 2, 4 says this. Go to the next slide there. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We know that when this happened, people came from all around. They were coming for Passover. They heard the disciples praying in the Spirit. Some of them thought they were drunk. Some of them thought they were a little crazy, but they began to hear them speaking in their own language and they heard the gospel. That was really the miracle. The miracle that they're speaking in tongues is one thing, but even a greater miracle is that all these people heard them in their own language. So these people that are in the upper room praying in tongues, others are hearing them in one language and another language and another language and another language. Why? Because God was using that to proclaim the gospel to all people. Now, some people would say, and that's where it ends. No more. But you can read on in Acts chapter 10, verse 45, 46, uh, 44, 45, 46, that 
There were some disciples that were saved. They hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet, but hands were laid on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 19 verses one through six. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? No, we haven't even heard of such a thing. Paul lays his hands on them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, other occasions, different occasions throughout the book of Acts. Now, whether the gospel or, or whether the use of tongues to spread the gospel ended with the apostles or not is really a moot point to me because the apostle Paul goes on and he teaches about the use of tongues in a corporate setting and in a private setting. And that relates more to us. And here's what he says. He teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. He teaches about the use of tongues in a corporate setting where somebody can give a message in tongues, but then somebody else give the interpretation. I prefer that somebody prophesy, but we all know that that has happened and it happens occasionally. Somebody give a message, interpretation of tongues. Uh, that's corporate use. That's when God is trying to get a message to his people and he uses people to do that. But there's a private use that is completely different. And that's when you're praying to God. You're not talking to men. You're not trying to get a message to anybody. You're communicating with God because in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul taught us that anyone who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the spirit. So there's a corporate element where God's trying to get a message through to his people. There's a private element where you're just wanting to communicate with him. Two different purposes, two different uses, and you shouldn't confuse the two. But then there's still another element that I want to introduce. One is a supernatural element, and the other is just a step of faith. And here's what I mean by that. There's a supernatural element, even like when it comes to being saved. When people get saved, we read about uh, the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, and he gets knocked to the ground. He's blinded for three days. Actually, I haven't read that yet. I'll, I talked about it in the last two services. <laughs> I knew I'd spoken about it. I'll get to it in just a minute. So here's Paul. He has this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, and is blinded for three days, has to go to a man's house by the name of Ananias for that man to lay hands on him in order for the scales to come off his eyes for him to see again. That was Paul's conversion experience. Supernatural, right? Most of us probably didn't have an encounter like that. How many of you, when you got saved, you were blinded for three days? Yeah, one. Okay. No, you're lying to me. Okay. The fact is most of us probably didn't have a supernatural. Some maybe did. Maybe there was something that you couldn't explain that happened to you. I know with me, it was just, I felt this urgency that God was saying, Hey, choose me. It's yes or no. And I had to make a choice, but there was no audible voice. I felt something in my spirit. I felt something inside, but I mean, Jesus didn't show it to me on a road to, you know, Frisco. It, it just, most of us didn't have that supernatural experience. You know what we had? We had a faith element. We had a step of faith where we chose to put our trust in Jesus Christ and we know we were born again. That's the supernatural part. But we just took a step of faith. Same thing happens like with being called in the ministry. I shared with you last week how when I was called in the ministry, I was praying and, uh, praying for people to accept the call when all of a sudden a man came over to me, Pastor Don Couch, and uh, he starts sharing with me basically everything I was praying. I felt like that was something supernatural. And I knew in that moment I was called in the ministry. In contrast to that, you got guys like, like, guys like Bill Wilson, who pastors Metro uh, Church up in New York City. His testimony has always been, I never had a call into the ministry. I just saw a need and decided to go meet the need and started ministering to kids. He's been doing that for over 30 years in New York. So, so there's a supernatural element, and there's also just a step of faith. The same thing is true when it comes to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some people have a supernatural experience where, boom, power of God hits you. You, know, you wake up laying on the floor, you know, speaking in tongues. That happens to some, but for others, it's just a step of faith just like salvation, just like getting called to ministry, just like believing for healing, 
You just take a step of faith and you begin to speak out. As you begin to speak out, God honors that. And I'll show just a little bit more about that. But there's, uh, there's a reason why we are to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in another tongue. It gives you a deeper life of praise and worship. It gives you a more perfect prayer. Uh, Romans 8, 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how we should pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words can express. You're making the groans, not necessarily words, but the Spirit is making intercession while you're praying, while you're speaking. And then you can build yourself up. You can have power according to Acts 1, 8. A lot of reasons why. So I've taken some time on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you're filled with the Spirit when you're saved, number one. Number two, you're filled with the Spirit when you're baptized in the Spirit. Number three, you're baptized or you're filled with the Spirit whenever you are stressed. Anybody ever get stressed? Every one of us gets stressed. We get pressed. We get pressured. We get persecuted or we just have tough times. Well, that happens. In the event here in Acts 4, 3, and 8, Peter and John were arrested. Why were they arrested? They were arrested because they were out doing a good thing. They were preaching the gospel. They helped uh, pray for a man. A man was healed. And because of that, they were put in jail. So they were arrested and put in jail. And then verse 8 says, then Peter filled with the Spirit. Now I'm going to point out again. Peter's here. Go back to number two. Go back again. Number two. Peter was here. Go back to number one. Peter was here. Different fillings. Same guy. Go back to number three. So then Peter filled with the spirit. If you look this up in the, in the Greek, it's a present filling. It's not the old one. It's a new one. Present filling. He said to them, rulers and elders of the people, and he starts preaching to them. This Jesus that you crucified, he is, he has been raised from the dead and Through him, all men are saved. He gets this boldness to begin to preach. So there is a filling that takes place whenever you're stressed, whenever you're pressured, when you're whenever you're up against a hard time. Joel, come up here and help me just for a minute. Let me show you this. This is what I call this filling is what I call bounce back ability. Because every one of us get our backs up against the wall at some time. You've got two basketballs here. They're both Spalding NBA. I'm sure you've been slam dunking these over there in the student center. Yeah, all over. So whenever you are filled with the spirit and you are pressed up against the wall or you're pressured or life is getting difficult, and you say, I need a present day filling just like Peter had here. When you do that, God gives you the ability to bounce back just like this. Bounce back ability. But if you don't, If you don't allow him to fill you up, this is what happens. That's right. You will fall flat every single time. That was so impressive, Joel. I just love. Yeah. So the difference is this one is flat. They look the same. They're made from the same company. But this one's flat because it didn't take the time to say, Holy Spirit, fill me up. You will not have the bounce back ability if you don't get filled with the Spirit. And I'm not talking about speaking in tongues right now. I'm just talking about being filled with the Spirit whenever you're stressed and pressured. It gives you that bounce back ability. And that jacket looks dope, man. I'm t- All right. Oh, thank you. Now, here's what I want you to know. The Holy Spirit is your friend. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. It wants to give you that bounce back ability. But there's still another time if the worship team comes back up here. There's another time that you're to be filled. Number four, and this is when you're to be used for service in ministry. When God wants to use you, when he gives a special assignment for you to step out, whether it's to share your faith with somebody, whether it's to pray for somebody, whether it's to start a business or whether it's to start a ministry, whatever it is, something to step outside of your comfort zone, he fills you up in that moment. In this story, in Acts chapter 9, this is the story where the Apostle Paul had been knocked down on the road, the road to Damascus, and he has this encounter with uh, Jesus. He's blinded. Then the Lord tells him, go to Ananias' house. He'll lay hands on you. He'll pray for you, and the scales will come off your eyes. You'll receive your sight. 
Then the Lord speaks to Ananias and said, hey, Ananias, I'm sending a guy to your house. Ananias says this, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. In other words, he's saying, are you crazy? You're sending this guy to my house? He kills people like me. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument. Everybody say chosen instrument. This man is my chosen instrument. I've chosen to use him. That's what an instrument is for, to be used. I've chosen to use him to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, their kings, and to the people of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. You just go lay hands on him. So then keep going. Then Ananias went to the house, entered, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Spirit. Again, it's a present filling. For what purpose? Because God had chosen Saul to be his instrument and he needed a filling in that moment to do what God had called him to do. God is calling each and every one of us to be his instrument everywhere we go. Come on, it's summertime and I know we're not in school, but you are still an instrument. Young people, you're an instrument everywhere you go. God wants to use you and he wants to fill you up with the power of his Holy Spirit so that he can use you to be a light in this dark world. At work, God wants to use you to be an instrument of light, to let people know that there's a better way to live, and it starts through Jesus Christ. God wants to use each and every one of us. You say, I don't have much to offer. You've got you. You. You are God's greatest possession. You're his prized possession, and all he wants to do is anoint you and fill you up so that you can be used for his glory. Back years ago, when I Starl and I, we were pastoring down in Houston. We started street ministry under a bridge on a, under Highway 59, downtown Houston. And it was our very first night. We kind of built it up. We had a big team there and a lot of people showed up. And, and uh, first night, we had done some music. We were singing and then I was preaching. When all of a sudden this guy started walking up from the back. And my first thought was, dude wants to come and get saved. And I hadn't even given the altar call yet. This is like Peter on the day of Pentecost. People are just getting saved. And the closer he gets, I can see the look on his face. And now he's not coming to get saved. Uh, I don't know what he's coming down here for, but it ain't good. And I remember so many things were going through my mind. What do I do? Do I stop? Do I call for reinforcement? Do I, what, what happens? And, and he just kept walking up. And I just remember, I remember just without saying it, I just remember Holy Spirit, I got to have some help right now. And then the, an anointing and a boldness came over me. And I started preaching like I'd never preached before. I mean, I was throwing it down. And this dude, he gets right up, he just gets right up in front of me. And, and rather than backing down, rather than acknowledge, I just kept preaching with more boldness, with more authority, with more conviction. And he just stood there. He just stood there and watched the whole time. Didn't move. Finally, when we were done, we got through praying and he kind of walked over to me. Big, tall guy. He's taller than L.A. He just looked at me and said, I like what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Turned around, walked off. Thought, whoa, okay. I don't know what that was all about, but he left. Next week, he came back. Informed me he was going to be my head usher at Street Church. I had no argument here. What's your name, brother? His name is Robert Hall. Kendall Bridges, nice to meet you. For the next few years, Robert served as our head usher at Street Church and saved me many times. The street fights that broke out and all kinds of stuff. He, I, I don't have time to go into all those stories. But I, I could keep you here all day. But about a year later, he finally opened up and he shared what happened that night. He said, I got to tell you, He said, I was sitting down under the bridge. You guys pulled up, started unloading your sound equipment, setting up chairs. You're out here singing. We're looking at each other like, what in the blank is going on on our turf? And they all look around. Who gave them permission? Nobody, nobody, no. And they all looked at me and said, what are you going to do about it? He said, I'm going to go take that preacher out. And he starts walking down. He said, I walked down. He said, I had every intention of shooting that preacher. He said, but when I got to the front, he said, something happened and I became paralyzed. And he said, I couldn't move. 
I had to just sit there and listen to everything he said. And I'm up here, all this stuff is going through my mind, not realizing the guy is actually paralyzed. I thought he was just kind of mental or something. He's just standing there. He's paralyzed and he couldn't move until after it was done. He said, the Lord told him, this is a good man. He's supposed to be here. He's my chosen instrument. Leave him alone. Protect him. And that's when Robert Hall became my head usher of Street Church. All I know is that when God calls you to do something, he will fill you up with the boldness in that moment to do exactly what he's called you to do. And if he's done that, the gates of hell can't stop you. The powers of darkness can't stop you. The demons from hell can't stop you. You just got to trust him. Let him fill you up. Here's the last time you're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is after we pass from this life. That's when you're to be raised from the dead at the resurrection. Because the Bible says it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. If he dwells in you, he'll quicken your mortal body. He'll give life to your mortal body through his spirit. So if you pass from this life, know this. There's still another filling that's coming. And that's when he raises us up to be together with him. But let me just tell you real quick. I'm going to hit these five real quick again. Here's what happens when you're filled. Number one, when you're saved, what's the result? The result is salvation. You come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Number two, when you're baptized in the Spirit, you get a spirit language. You can pray in the Spirit. You can worship in the Spirit. You can communicate. You can intercede, and God will use you. Number three, when you're stressed or pressured or persecuted, it results in boldness and peace, just like I talked about. Or number four, whenever you're to be used, it results in confirmation. You know that God has called you to do this, and nothing's going to stop you. And of course, number five, it results in resurrection, and thank God we're all going to be resurrected one day. Here's what I know today. Every single one of us need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, regardless of whether it's in salvation or whether it's in baptism or whether it's uh, for uh, being used in the ministry or whether you're being pressured, uh, in, uh, you're under stress in your life. The Holy Spirit's your friend, and he wants to help you and encourage you and empower you to be able to live this life for Christ.